Barth will be talking to us today about monitoring glacier velocities in the Russian High Arctic. All right. Um, thank you, Aisha. I'm just going to jump right into it here. Um, so this is a map of the Russian High Arctic. Uh, we have a, a red box around the globe to look at the area. Um, right here we have the coastline of northern Russia. This is the Arctic Sea. And these are the island archipelagos that make up the Russian High Arctic. Um, specifically today, we're going to be focusing on Severnaya Zemlya on an ice cap known as the Academy of Sciences on the northern side of it. <clears throat> so this is a zoom in on the Academy of Sciences. And the letters here are what we like to call ice streams or areas where ice is flowing out into the ocean. Um, there are five that we looked at. And um, so this is um, an outline of the ice here. And around that is the, the ocean. It's a, a little hard to see. So a couple things we had in mind when we did this project. Uh, so as this ice flows out into the ocean, the, the water level contributes to um, ocean level rise. And although this ice cap is not nearly as big as Antarctica or Greenland, uh, if all of the glaciers in the Russian High Arctic were to melt, God forbid, it would contribute a total of um, about 41 millimeters to sea level rise. So it is still significant in the global scheme of things. The area has been studied before, but the, the data is not quite as high resolution as what we have now. When I say high resolution, the, the satellites we used were about one meter per pixel, and past data on the area is about 15 meters per pixel. So there has been significant um, developments in that technology. We also have data from 1995 that I'm going to compare my data to, which was taken from about 2011 through 2013. And using these changes in velocity, we can determine if the glaciers are accelerating over time. So to do this, we implement a process known as pixel tracking. And we select two satellite images taken a couple months apart. I'll explain the time separation later. But basically, we focus on something in the ice stream that we can track throughout time. So we take a picture of one image. We pick a spot. We find the same spot in the second image. And using the change in distance and the time separation, we obtain a velocity. <clears throat> So this distinct feature that we're looking for in these ice streams is known as a crevasse, which are just cracks in the ice. And these are ideal because they're large. There is a, a person right here for scale. So these can get pretty big. Um, they're large. You can pick them out in the ice streams. And they look fairly similar as they progress through the stream. So you can find them in both images. Um, we also look for bedrock in these um, satellite images because uh, the pixel tracking process, if we see movement in the bedrock, we use this to determine our uncertainties, because obviously that should not be happening. So one thing to take into account when looking at these, um, when picking our pairs for pixel tracking are the seasonal variations. Um, in order for this process to work, as I mentioned, we need distinct features. And in the, in the winter, these ice caps are covered in ice and um, snow, and snow looks very uniform. And there's also a lot of sea ice extent, which also looks very uniform. So it's hard for our program to pick something distinct to find a velocity. Um, so in the, in the winter, if we tried this process, it would try to focus on snow, which is not distinct at all. And we obtained something called noise, which are just not coherent data sets. Um, the, there's a, a process known as Arctic ampli amplification that um, states that the areas of the, the Arctic are heating up at a faster rate than the rest of the world. And this also contributes to um, the melting of the glaciers in the area. So this is not my data, but it overlaps with my data a little bit. So again, um, the satellites we used were 2011 through 2013. This is 2009 through 2012. and. Um, for those of you that can't see the scale bar, we're looking at a meters per day scale, which is pretty significant um, compared to some geologic um, phenomena. So the, again, these are the five streams. Um, 
pixel tracking, um, data overlapping with ours. So this is our data. We're looking at uh, ice stream B on the southern side of the ice cap. And to understand this, this, uh, this white line here is dividing the land on this side and the water on this side. And our velocities, um, we found a maximum velocity of about 2.5 on this specific ice stream. Comparing to overlapping data, it's uh, about three. Um, so fairly similar, fairly consistent. Um, so the 1995 data we have is, it's a little hard to compare because this, the, the, the past data does not go all the way to the front of the glaciers. And the fronts of the glaciers are important because this is where we see the, the higher velocities, as you can see here. Um, the warmer colors are higher velocities. So in 1995, um, they found a movement of, of about 2.21 meters per day, and we're looking at about 2.5 meters per day in our data. So it's a pretty significant increase. Um, similar data, um, we're looking at ice stream C on the right this time. Um, the land is on the left, water on the right. So compared to overlapping data, 2.5 meters per day to three meters per day, and 0.38 meters per day was the, the past data. So again, a very significant increase in velocity. Similar data, ice stream D on the right. Um, so again, this is land. This white line divides the land and the water. So 0.25 or 2.5 to about three, um, fairly consistent. and. 0.26 meters per day compared to 2.5. Again, a very significant increase in velocities. So conclusions we can draw from this. Um, the data we obtained on these ice streams were coherent in that they did not have a lot of noise, as I was talking about, for three of the five ice streams in the area. And compared to past work, as I showed in these ice streams that we had coherent data for, um, they are accelerating significantly. So. There are significant changes going on in the area, and we, we measured those. This is a, a, my favorite picture of the ice cap. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks, Garth. Do we have any questions? Wesley. Hey, Garth. So my question is is um, about the older data that you had from 1995. Uh, you said that there was some marginal error in that because the pixels were 15 by right. one pixel per uh, per meter. And so I'm just curious, like that max error that's associated with the older data. If you were to contribute that to the older um, the older what was it 0.25 or right, so right. rate of meters per day. Yes. If you were to contribute to that, would it come anywhere near, anywhere close to today's rate that we see of like 2.5? You mean if it was within the uncertainty? Would yeah, it be within, yeah. Does that that uncertainty, if you were to add the max uncertainty, does it come anywhere close? Just curious. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but mm -hmm. I, I don't believe it was that high of an uncertainty. It wasn't a, that high. Okay. That magnitude. No, I don't think so. Okay, great. Oh wow. Okay. Glenn, you've already had a couple. Um, <laughs> Holly. I actually kind of have a, a follow-up question. Um, so you said in the older data set that they weren't able to get velocities all the way to the toe of the glacier. So if you have any idea of sort of where they were able to get their max velocities, could you compare those to the same areas um, in your data set versus the max velocities? So, right. So what I did was I just picked out the maximum velocities, which were not geo-referenced to older data, but given more time, we would overlay the data in the same areas to compare directly to the past data. I saw some other hands. Uh, Jim. Um, I was just curious if you have any constraints on ice mass or like elevation changes between 95 and, and present. Is it is it just moving faster or is there also more or less of it? You mean the change in height? Specifically? Yeah, like the volume of the of the ice cap or of the areas that you looked at? Is I did not focus on that, but there are other people in my lab that I believe looked at the, the change in elevation. And they use similar techniques um, with pixels, I think. Yeah. Jackie. Hmm. 
is there data between 1995 to 2009? Or? There, there was one more um, data set. Um, I think it was 2002, if you okay. don't remember, remember the range, but it was a similar technique from 1995. And I, I, d I didn't include that because it would you know, take too long to compare oh, okay. the number I of data sets. Yes. I was just wondering since yes, I noticed there was uh, like a slight uh, decrease, I guess, in the velocities from the 2009-2011. Right. So I, th now. I think that would be due to the uncertainties and um, the pixel sizes of that data. Okay. I just know if there would be like fluctuations right. throughout no. time. Right. No. Yeah, definitely. Velocity. All right. Any other questions? Glenn, do you want to ask your question? <laughs> I mean, we have time. If you want. Okay. If we have time. <laughs> uh, so t two questions. One is a technical question that's right. directly related to your work. Uh, so the 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 surface velocity of the glaciers is not uniform. It's, you know, has a certain spatial distribution. Okay. So you pick just the maximum velocity that you could find in your study area? Yes, it is. The, the next question is more about the mechanism. So why are the, the velocities increasing? Do you have an idea about what's causing an increase in the velocity? Climate variation is definitely a, con a contributing factor, but the, the glacier interactions are so complicated that I can't directly say that one thing is causing the changes. Well, more specifically, is it the fact that the sea level is rising that's changing the grounding line on the, on the, on the outlet glacier, or is it related to the change in the ambient temperature? Both could contribute. Um, these are tidewater glaciers, which means they are heavily affected by ocean currents. Um, but temperature also affects the, the melting rate, so it could contribute to an increase in velocity. So I'd say both, yeah. All right, Brian. Are there any, is this ice cap particularly representative of the behavior of ice caps in general? And are there any international implications of the results of your research in terms of, because you said they were also studying the same ice cap in 1995. Mm -hmm. Relationships with Russia are obviously a little different, you know, from now to, to then. Are there any sort of international implications? So this is the, the largest ice cap on Severn Ice Emilia. And, uh, they're melting at a, a faster rate compared to larger glaciers like Greenland or Antarctica. So if we look at the kind of the pattern at which they're melting, I guess that could be applied to larger um, velocities or larger areas. Just yeah, based on the the correlation between the two. It has a little bit more diversity than other uh, ice caps. It has more going on. Um, it's, it's happening at a faster rate. I think that's the main thing. So assuming that other glaciers will react the same way, um, so kind of a projection of what might happen in other areas. All right. Thanks, Garth. Okay.